Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Grip Media. My name is John McGurk, and this is the series of interviews I'm doing with candidates who are seeking your vote on June the 7th for the European elections. We are staying in the Ireland South constituency today, and we are going to be talking to somebody who most people feel is the independent candidate with the biggest chance, according to the bookies and the opinion polls, of actually taking a seat. He's a sitting TD for Clare. Many of you will know him. His name is Michael McNamara. Michael, it's great to have you with us. How are you? Good morning, John. Well, thanks. Uh, well, I can imagine it's fairly tiring at this stage with about a week to go until polling. Um, but I suppose one of the things I'm going to start by asking you is, you're a, a sitting TD. <clears throat> it's a pretty good job. You got a fairly substantial mandate from the people of Clare at the last election. Um, a lot of people are wondering, what is, why is it that you now want to go to the European Parliament? What is it that you can do in Europe that you can't do in the Dáil? And why do you think it's so important that you switch jobs? Well, I mean, firstly, it's a, obviously a, a, a huge honour um, to, to represent Clare, um, particularly, I suppose, <laughs> given the history of, of, of Clare in politics and uh, those who've represented us and the impact that they've had and to to be able to try to follow in their footsteps, even in a, even in a, in a very minor way, is, is a great honour. Um, why would I like to run for the European Parliament? Well, I, I'm quite interested in legislation and lawmaking. Obviously, I think holding decision makers to account is hugely important. I, I have sought to do that in this stall with some successes and often not getting the answers uh, to the questions that I've asked. Uh, but I mean, I have been uh, seeking to hold them to account, seeking to make them answer the difficult questions. I think it's important that somebody does that at a European level. But it's also important that we um, engage with European legislation because more and more areas that affect our lives are legislated for in Europe. Um, and I believe there's a possibility of doing that in Europe because you don't have a government or an opposition. You do have political groupings, but you don't have whips. The reality is in 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 um, the Dáil, uh, no matter wh- how valid the criticism you make of a piece of legislation, no matter how beneficial the amendments that you're proposing might be, no matter what people privately think of them, um, the uh, once the whips uh, uh, are come on, then um, all the government TDs just vote for it, even uh, with reservation, but they vote for it. Um, that makes for very bad legislation. I think it makes for bad politics. It, it effectively makes for legislation by civil servants. Uh, I think we're seeing more and more of that. I think people are getting tired of it. But that is the system that applies in in, um, in Ireland, unfortunately. It's almost unique in Europe, uh, and it's one that is... Um, Somewhat frustrating, I have to say, for somebody who takes legislation seriously. I mean, that's not to say that I have poured through every single bill that's gone through the doll, but certainly I have chosen bills. Um, uh, the Mayor of Limerick bill, I think it's a great idea to have a directly elected Mayor of Limerick. But um, as the stages went on, uh, more and more powers were taken, reserved from this newly elected mayor and given to the unelected CEO, who's effectively um, a, a viceroy of... Uh, the customs house in every county and, and local authority. Uh, likewise, this um, agriculture and food supply chain bill, which was to bring transparency in the food chain, uh, marked a, a watering down of protection for horticulture producers. Uh, there are some, but not a huge amount of horticulture producers in um, in sort of the Midwest um, uh, where I, I live, but there are a lot of them in uh, Wexford and the Southeast they're seeing their protections decreased rather than increased. And, of course, the fatal flaw in it is that it uh, has no provisions uh, or no meaningful provisions to require um, the retailers to outline what they're paying to processors. And that's the only way that you could find out where the actual profits are going in the food chain. So, I mean, that, that, that and then, of course, <clears throat> there's the hate speech bill, which, uh, which you will have covered, um, that... Uh, after the referendum, all of the, um, uh, or at least pers- uh, some TDs from every uh, of the three big parties came out and said, oh, it's a terrible piece of legislation, terrible piece of legislation. How did that ever get here? But they all voted for it at every stage along the way to get to, to, to get it through the doll. So, I mean, I, I just think um, uh, we have a long way to go in, in how we make legislation in Ireland. I think I would like to think that I have something to contribute in that regard and it's something I would like to try to contribute. Uh, but obviously, it's that's a decision for the people of, of, of Ireland South. Um, when you go to the European Parliament, obviously, you make, you, you make the correct point that there's no whip there and you have you know, 
politicians who are in political groups obviously have substantially more freedom to di- differ from their political groups than they do in the Oireachtas. But nonetheless, you'll, you, you'll probably have to join a political group uh, if you want to get the kind of speaking time and and committee assignments maybe that you wouldn't get as a totally non-aligned person. So have you any ideas what direction you're, you're, you're going in? I understand you're an independent and people should know that Michael isn't going to be dodging this question if he says he doesn't know exactly yet. Because as an independent, you're not, you know, you have to negotiate as an individual, but you must have some idea of what direction you want to go in. And, you know, could you tell the, the voters what that's going to be? Well, I mean, first of all, up to now, I would agree with you that you have had to join a, a group. I think there may well be more non-aligned uh, MEPs in the next uh, parliament. It would be interesting to see how the parliament deals with that, with its <laughs> rules and procedures. But, I mean, up to now, certainly most, if not all, independent uh, MEPs from Ireland have aligned themselves with a, with a group. I haven't genuinely haven't thought very much about it. I mean, I, I'm not preempting the decision that will be made. I mean, I certainly wouldn't be wasting a huge amount of time contacting groups um, and negotiating with them rather than campaigning in Ireland South. And if I'm elected, I will then talk to the the, the groupings. It would probably be one of the the the, the groupings that are the, the bigger groupings that engage most with. Um, legislation rather than those who sort of shout more from the sidelines. Uh, but I will it, it look to join a group, whichever one I think is closest to lines with what I stand for and is also most beneficial where I can exert most influence on behalf of those who have elected me. But I, I, I don't know which one. I haven't approached any of them. I haven't spoken to any of them. Uh, there will be time for that if I'm elected. And that's not something that I'm uh, presupposing in any way. Another thing some of your opponents, people challenge you maybe from the right flank in this election, would say about you, and I want to put it to you, is that there, that yours has been kind of a political evolution because you um, were first elected as a TD for the Labour Party. Um, and you are now obviously an independent. And indeed, it's fair to say that over the last year or two, your, 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 your policy positions have diverged greatly from the Labour Party under Ivana Bacic. But has there been a political evolution in your thinking since 2016 when you were first elected to the doll, I suppose is what I'm asking you. Um, there has to some extent, but I mean, I, I would also think that there's been a bit of a political evolution in the, in, in the Labour Party since uh, 2011. Um, I, I think it was... Look, I, I don't want to talk about the Labour Party, but I think it's interesting to watch... The, the evolution of the Labour Party as a political scientist. Obviously, I'm not uh, I'm quite disinterested. I have no more interest in, in the Labour Party than any other uh, party at this stage. My own thinking, um, I, I don't think it has hugely. I mean, in the uh, at the end of 2014, the International Protection Act was introduced and um, I was very interested in it. Uh, I was, that's governs basically the, the how we determine asylum claims in Ireland. Um, I was interested in it and I was interested in the fact that it was being guillotined without any discussion. It was something that I opposed vociferously at the time. Um, I, I had an interest in, in migration then and immigration. It wasn't obviously as big an issue in the country a, as it is now. But I mean, I think then as now, I had the position that we have to have an immigration system. It has to be fair. It has to be efficient and it has to be fast. Um and that a large amount of state resources then were being wasted by the Department of Justice on an inefficient system that wasn't able to decide cases speedily. Because, I mean, people are in state-provided accommodation while their case is being decided. And that is a huge problem here, because as more and more people come into the system and more and more decisions are not being made at the same rate at which people are applying, um then obviously there are more and more people that we have to accommodate in a country where there is a shortage of accommodation. Now, that was always the case. This was back then. There was the, 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 the sheer human wastage of people sitting in direct provisions for two, three, four years waiting for decisions to be made. Those times have come down, but nowhere ne- it's still not nearly as fast as it should be or needs to be given the pressures on um, uh, accommodating people as they await a decision. But people sitting in direct provision centres without the right to work. I mean, I think that was uh, absurd. Uh, and I, at the time, wanted Ireland to um, uh, uh, opt into the, the um, reception directive, which gives the people, which would give asylum seekers the right to work after six months if their claim hasn't been determined. Now, that's indicative of a view 
the claims should be determined in six months. But even now, claims are not even a first instance decision isn't being made within six months. I mean, we have, I think it was approximately 21,500 people awaiting a first instance decision at the end of April, of whom 30% were waiting more than 12 months. So, I mean, that is a, 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 an issue. Um, if you want me to continue about immigration. Well, I mean, well, I'm going to ask you just to follow up on that. Do you think that is primarily a problem with the legislation or primarily a problem with the administration of the legislation? So is it is it that the system is under-resourced or is it a yes. bad system? No, it's primarily a problem with uh, with the administration. Um, and that's why I, I this idea that uh, the EU Migration Pact and the new timelines that are contained in that will be a panacea. I mean, there has been nothing stopping the Department of Justice speeding up um, the um, determination of cases and, and resourcing it adequately and making sure that you had people in there who uh, were, were properly trained to make the decisions. In fairness, now, Alan Shatter, who um, uh, did improve the system during his brief tenure in terms of the quality of the decision making and putting panels in place to make these decisions. Um, since then, I think it's I, I mean, the decision making is still a lot better than it was before um, Shatter improved. But the, in any event, the problem is administration. I mean, we seem to, as a state, have a huge problem. And we're, we're great at plans. I mean, we we announce a plan a day, uh, but executing mm-hmm. them is a huge challenge for the state. I mean, the, the, the children's hospital and the gross waste of exchequer funding around that is one example of that. Mm. Yeah. Housing, all the plans for lots more housing um, is another. And I suppose the difficulty is we have um, an economy that is looking for more and more labour and we have nowhere to accommodate them. And that too impacts on the immigration system. I mean, there are undoubtedly some people who come here fleeing persecution, uh, but there are a greater number of people who come here because they think that they can get a future here. Mm-hmm. And and we do have an economy that requires workers, but there's, again, a disconnect between the immigration system and um, the economy, because the only, unless you get a work permit, and even if you get a work permit, I mean, I'm, I know there are many cases where somebody's been granted a work permit, and then the Department of Justice turn around and say, oh, we're not giving you a visa because we actually don't think you're qualified for the job of the Department of Enterprise, which is the one with the skill set to, to determine this, has even though the Department of Enterprise have said that you are, that this is a job that is a skilled job that, you know, falls into the work permit system and you are a suitable person to get it, even though they have made that determination, we're going to go off and second guess that determination. Yep. Uh, well, well my, Michael, I'm going to, I'm going to stop you there because I don't want to, I don't want to, I just like, obviously you're going to the European Parliament where you'll be giving up your, yes, your right to yes. some extent to, to influence the Department of Justice, although a lot of what you're saying is entirely correct. I want to ask you about something that, that you might have a say in, in the European Parliament on the issue of migration before we move on to agriculture and other issues. And that is this business of the Mediterranean and the, the, the general pan-European pact, uh, sorry, pan-European approach to migration. I mean, one of the biggest challenges, obviously, is the number of people um, constantly coming in, seeking refuge from North Africa, from Syria, from from Eastern Europe. Uh, what can Europe be doing to to better manage the problem of people coming and arriving in Lampedusa, for example, crossing the the Mediterranean? Um, is there a case? One of your fellow candidates, Niall Boylan, on this very interview the other day said, for example, we should be turning those boats around. Is that a, a position you would share, or 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 do you think there's a different way to deal with that problem? Yeah, I mean, it it really depends on what you can do safely, because, I mean, we are aware of boats that there were attempts to turn back that um, that uh, ended up at the bottom of the Mediterranean uh, and, and uh, many of the, almost all of the lives on it, um, including, you know, children and women lost. I mean, I, I just think we need to be very mindful of that. I mean, if we if we view human life as important, then every human life is important. Um, uh, but uh, what the European Union needs to do is, I mean, is look at root, and it's not a short, it, there's, I'm not saying this is going to improve some things overnight, but I mean, there's been a huge increase in the number of people willing to take their lives in their hands to leave uh, their homes. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that obviously, Conflict and is a, is an issue in some of the countries. Growing inequality is an issue in others. Lack of economic opportunities. I mean, we were 
told for decades now that the European Union that we were going to they were going to develop their neighbouring states and their various programmes in place for the Middle East and North Africa and there was going to be development through trade and there were going to be human rights clauses and now we start to discover that those human rights clauses are pretty unenforceable. Mm -hmm. I mean I think we do need to the European Union does need to look at that. I mean as regards um, turning people back I mean I think there probably, I mean, uh, there, there will be take back agreements, but that's a different thing to turning boats back. Uh, I think you need to be very careful if you're turning a boat back that you're not um, sinking the boat, which, um, which uh, you know, there was all the the, the, the video evidence around uh, one of the the boats some time ago. Um, not, so I, okay. I would be cautious around that. Okay, let's move on to because you mentioned trade. Let's move on to trade and agriculture because obviously I, I think there's a there are two issues here. First of all, there's obviously farming in, in Ireland South, which is a huge issue. Yeah. Um, and the desire of many of the farming organizations to be very cautious about entering into new trade agreements. But isn't there a case also, Michael, that the, the absence of these trade agreements or the protectionist nature of some of the European Union's trade agreements is actually disadvantaging countries in the global South to protect farmers in Europe and thus maybe contributing to the migration crisis? Like, is there a balance to be struck between protecting farmers here and being fair to developing economies who want to export their beef and their and their their food produce to Europe, and where do you stand on that? Yeah, but I mean, fairness is hugely important. Um, but is it? Irish farmers have to operate to high environmental standards. They're subject to lots of uh, regulation, um, more than they would like. Lots of inspection, more than they would like. I mean, to expect them to compete uh, with farmers that are subject to none of that is, um, to me, unfair. Now, it's not... You're probably referencing the Mercosur Agreement. Yes, I, I, I am. Say this, I would say the same thing of uh, CETA and the Canadian Agreement. I mean, uh, there were assurances given, of course, that, um, that no... Um, um, beef that had been administered growth hormones would be exported to Europe but it is they are not unlawful in Canada they are used and I think it's a little bit fanciful I mean they typically use uh, some months before um, slaughter so that um, so that uh, they will have their desired effect um, and be out of uh, the, their system so I mean I, I just find it a bit fanciful that you'll have farmers who, who, who will administer uh, growth hormones to some of their cattle and not to others and say, oh, well, those ones now are for the European market and we, we mm-hmm. you know, we, we have special cognizance of that. So, I mean, it's not, it, it's a general trading position. If we're going to require EU uh, farmers to operate to very high environmental standards, high welfare standards, uh, which I think is proper that we do, well, then they have to be protected from unfair competition. Um, I, I just don't see how you can operate it otherwise. I mean, there was an interesting study done by UCC published in the past fortnight or so um, that consumers are more and more concerned with um, uh, eating sustainable food, uh, but they're not prepared to pay for it. So, I mean, that's where sort of it, it that, that that's where the crux is. And so are, are we going to require farmers to produce more and more and more sustainably, uh, but then, um, uh, require them to compete with um, with those who are not producing sustainably. Well, speaking of competition and staying on this topic of farming, I'll move on to the, sort of the climate targets, because Ireland, as you know, was committed to a 51% reduction in carbon uh, emissions by 2030. Now, we're nowhere near as it stands, of course, to hit those targets. The Irish Times reported this week we're going to miss them by 20%, something like that, um, or more. Um, is it sustainable, in your view, for for Ireland and indeed Europe as a whole to have targets like a 51% reduction by 2030 when countries like Brazil and China and India uh, are are hitting targets that are nowhere near that and in some cases missing their targets as well. And isn't it the case that if we do stick with that, that that Irish farmers are going going to, and indeed Irish industry is going to really suffer in comparison to industry in China and much of the developing world? And is that fair? Yeah, I mean, that is um, undoubtedly true. I mean, I think some of the targets that were set are clearly overambitious, but I suppose if we're going to... I mean, there's two sides to the emissions thing. One is um, the um, 
uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but the other is, of course, um, sort of energy self-sufficiency, and if that could be achieved in Ireland through the use of um, uh, floating offshore wind, which Leo Varadkar described as our moonshot, but unfortunately his administration did little to to advance. I think energy self-sufficiency, energy self-sufficiency would be a, a goal worth striving for in and of itself, even if there were no other benefits to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but as regards the targets, it was their argument is that you've been you in the global sort of um, north, you in the west, or the global mm-hmm. north, have been developing industry since the industrial revolution, uh, and we are only now um, embarking on that, and we need to be given time. Uh, whereas you've had all the time that you need. Um, it's pretty hard to argue with that. But, I mean, I suppose one of the concerns that I would have would be um, sort of that the state is great at finding sectors to blame um, but isn't doing a huge amount itself to meet those targets. I mean, we are one of the few countries, I would have thought, with diesel trains running between our main uh, sorry, few countries in in Europe with diesel trains running between our cities. Um, the 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 rail. I used to get um, uh, the train in the station called Burt Hill uh, for years. Um, it now takes longer than it ever took to get to Dublin. So I now drive to Ballybrophy, which is kind of halfway to Dublin, rather than get the train. I'd much rather get the train in Burt Hill and and be able to get mm-hmm. to Dublin. So I mean, I think the state has huge steps to take that it's not taking before it can require um, sort of the private sector to curb, uh, to, to, to incur uh, financial loss. And that's kind of where the state is at at the moment. It's sort of, it's easy, of course, to blame uh, farmers, but it's, I don't see it taking any steps, nor did it. Um, uh, there's now a, a biomethane scheme. Uh, the government is putting 40 million into it which the IFA have rightly called out as, as an entirely inadequate sum that would, you know, develop biomethane and put it into as a replacement for natural gas. Um, there was an EU, a European-wide scheme where funding was made available last year. The Italian government drew down, I think, 1.4 billion euros from that. Uh, we didn't even apply. If we were serious about mitigating um, emissions in the agriculture sector rather than actually crippling farming if if that if the goal was to mitigate rather than to cripple farmers um then uh, i think we would have applied for that scheme and we would uh, be developing a big because uh, a, a big biomethane sector um the commission identified in denmark as the two countries with greatest potential in that regard uh denmark is is moving towards it's not quite there but it's moving towards 40 percent of its natural gas requirements being um um produced from um biomethane uh, in the near future we're currently at zero the, the the plan the government plan announced and i think it was even implicit in the announcement that the government funding wouldn't achieve this was to produce 5.7 terawatt hours uh industry alone consumes 10 terawatt hours in ireland 5.7 would be just 10 percent of ireland's uh gas consumption so uh, we have a long way to go. This is, seems to me to be an administration that's heavy on rhetoric, but very light on on actions to help sectors like transport, like um, agriculture, to reduce their emissions. I mean, it's not going to happen without government action, and the government is doing nothing other than blaming farmers and blaming uh, people who drive a diesel car uh, when there is no practical alternative in, in much of if you're driving long distances across rural Ireland. Okay, we move on to our final topic, which is um, obviously when you go to Brussels, you'll have far more say as an MEP on sort of or far more an important voice, I suppose, on matters of foreign policy and foreign affairs in Europe than you do as a TD. So I'm going to ask you about three the three biggest topics on that. First of all, um, you'll be going to a parliament that has a much more um, a much less united view on what's happening in the Middle East than the Oireachtas, for example, does. Um What's your view on the EU-Israel Trade Association Agreement? Should that be reviewed? Should it be opened? Um, you'll obviously come up against huge resistance from people from Germany, Slovakia, various other countries that are very pro-Israel um, in the parliament. Um, should Ireland have recognised the Palestinian state this week? And what, what will your approach be to that issue in the coming months as a new MEP while that war is still ongoing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the EU Trade Association, uh, the 
EU Israel Trade Association agreement should be reviewed in light of how I mean Israel absolutely has a right to uh, to defend itself, but it's a, it's a question of how it's doing that, and it, it does appear. Uh, and the ICJ and the International Court of Justice have have determined that it is pursuing that in a way that is not adequately uh, is not having adequate regard for civilian um, lives. Um, so in that context, I, I just don't see how the argument can be made from a, a rule of law perspective that the um, that that the agreement should not be reviewed. Uh, but that's not to say, I mean, that there aren't other countries uh, with respect to which it should be reviewed. I mean, the um, the um, uh, policy that's, I mean, the EU is very slow to criticise Israel for uh, sort of attacks a, a on civilian infrastructure uh, when it was very fast to criticise, uh, and rightly so, uh, to criticise uh, Russia for attacks on civilian in- infrastructure in um in um, in Ukraine, and um, now I suppose there is the difference that uh, Israel was doing it in pursuit of um, uh, defending itself from Hamas attacks and rooting out Hamas, whereas the Russian one was based on um, sort of expansionist aggression. But uh, either way, I mean, I think there is a requirement to pursue uh, military um, adventures um, in a manner which respects human life. I mean, we saw, and that, that's I think. There's been a shift in military thinking. I mean, even in Kosovo, the um, uh, the um, the you know the advice of uh, was it uh, General Sir Mike Jackson that uh, he had spent what, what did he say to Blair's government? He had spent uh, long enough uh, trying to capture warlords without wishing to jo- uh, join any of them in the dock in the, in the Hague. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it is I think an increasingly important aspect of like what was the the other question was around what particular. Well, Israel and what was the other one? Well, do you think it was right to recognise Palestine this week? Um, yeah, I mean, everybody is saying that the two-state solution is the only possibility. I mean, I don't think that I'm sure there are many in Israel who, who view a two-state solution as um, still attainable. I don't think the current administration in Israel and I haven't been watching it as closely as I might otherwise if I wasn't out uh, campaigning all day and all evening um, but it seems to me that the current administration in Israel is not pursuing that in any meaningful way I mean mm-hmm. there has to be some kind of a, a peaceful settlement uh, to what is happening in the in the Middle East I mean a state uh, uh, I mean a, a, a state cannot um, rely on um, military might to maintain itself indefinitely, but a state shouldn't have to either. And I mean, a state should not be under attack. I do appreciate that there's a that that Israel is in a very difficult situation of being surrounded by neighbours who who wish to destroy it. I mean, that's almost uh, unique. But mm-hmm. um, but allowing the Palestinian question. Uh, to continue and not providing some, uh, not not furthering the two-state solution um, is, I think, giving um, support or is making it very easy for those who wish to um, portray Israel uh, in a very negative light. All right. Okay, we, I'm very conscious of your time, and I have, I have only two questions left, but I think they're both relatively important. They're both on foreign policy. The biggest single row in the European Union in the last two years probably was on the the Hungarian government's attempts to block 50 billion in aid that went to Ukraine, um, m- most of which was military, military aid. There, there is almost certainly, if the war continues, as it appears to be, it's going to continue for another while yet, going to be another round of, of aid, you know, at least requested by the Ukrainians of the European Union. Uh, in your view as an MEP in the parliament, if, should you be there, um, should the, should the European Union continue to support Ukraine militarily for as long as the Ukrainians seek that support? Um, I think supporting the Ukraine militarily is one thing, but like there needs to be another track. I mean, this bombast from um, von der Leyen and her commission, I think, hasn't helped the situation. I mean, the Ukraine has a right to defend itself militarily and uh, and um, 
should be supported in that. But there has to be another track. There has to be an attempt to find a solution to this. I mean, anybody who I, I think those who hope for a military solution should be very careful of what they wish for, you know, because uh, I, I, I'm not convinced that a military solution will be one that um, that w- will return to um the pre uh, 2014 borders f- far from it in fact mm-hmm. um so um yeah i just think um von der Leyen has been good with the, the the jingoism um i suppose the german economy is in the doldrums because of the some of the measures they took to uh, decarbonize their economy they became very reliant on russian gas then when that um was no longer available they i mean German industry seems to be in a very bad place. The German economy seems to be in a very bad place. And uh, um, uh, building up the armaments industry would be a, a way to uh, to inject a bit of dynamism into the German economy. But, I mean, we've been on this cycle before and we know where it, it ends. And it, it ends in a very, in my view, very bad um, place. So, I mean, I, I, I don't, um, hmm. I just couldn't support her, her policy. Um, oh. Uh, and the, the, the sort of jingoism that she's engaged in, I mean, I think is deeply unhelpful and was not what the European Union was founded on. Okay. I mean, it, w- I accept that Russia poses a threat, but I mean, uh, this is not the first time that there's been a threat to Europe. I mean, there were nuclear warheads pointed at every European capital from the other side of the Iron Curtain only 30 years ago. Um, yet we could... we we. Uh, moved beyond the jingoism beyond the 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 the, the let's um, let's capitalize on the fear uh to um actually negotiating and uh, right. eventually the withdrawal of soviet troops from um fr- from eastern europe all right very last question um some of the most important undersea cables connecting europe to the united states and north america run through the waters of the irish economic zone and in irish territorial waters at present this state has one serviceable naval vessel. Uh, there was an article in Political Europe the other day. Basically, it was I think it was written by an Irish guy, Owen Dre, actually, but I think it reflects some opinion in Europe, certainly, that Ireland is essentially freeloading um, and that the defence of Europe, I mean, if, there, if the European Union was drawn into a conflict or many of its member states were, there's an argument that those cables are a, a strategic target, even though they're in Irish waters. Is Irish is Irish neutrality number one sustainable, and number two, are, are Irish levels of military spending at the moment sustainable? And what's your view on that going into a European Parliament that will be discussing a lot of these issues over the next five years? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, um, yes, Irish neutrality is sustainable. No, our level of military spending isn't. Clearly, <coughs> and particularly if we maintain neutral, we need to be able to to defend ourselves we need to be able to defend uh, our, our territorial seas uh, although i mean I, i'll come back to the cables in a moment but we do need to have uh, a navy that is capable of uh, patrolling our um, territorial seas we need to have an air force that's capable of patrolling our skies rather than relying on the raf um and uh, we need to have a a, a 21st century radar system which we don't have either i mean we don't know what's happening in our airspace uh, at the moment we're relying on the raf to tell us what's happening they obviously i, I would assume like most militaries act in the interest of their own state rather than in the, in the interest of another state so i mean current military spending in ireland is completely unsustainable particularly if we're serious about neutrality i mean if you look at finland which i has obviously uh, abandoned its uh, policy of neutrality and arguably um, the uh, the the uh, treaty that was signed with Molotov in was it 44 or 45 uh, are, are not entirely but it's certainly in the aftermath of the Second World War where the Soviet troops withdrew from f- from Finland but I mean they spent quite he- while they were a neutral state they spent quite heavily on them um, uh, on their own military Austria um, is a neutral state uh, but does spend considerably more than we do, and I think we need to we need to look at building up our military capacity, uh, particularly if we're serious about neutrality. I think actually neutrality has served as well. People say, "Oh, well, neutrality is just a, 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 a an accident of history and geography in Ireland." But I mean, every country's um, foreign policy is is a determined by their history and their geography, be that Switzerland, be it Ireland, be it uh, Austria, or be it um, uh, Finland. So I, I do think that neutrality is sustainable, but I, we clearly need 
to have a, a fairly massive increase in defence spending in Ireland. As for the subsea cables, I mean, yes, they're an important strategic, um, um, uh, they're huge, of huge strategic importance, but they're also vast and the oceans are vast. I mean, I think if, if somebody wants to cut those cables, I, I'm not convinced the US military would be able to stop them being blown up if they, if, if somebody actually wants to do that. I mean, Denmark is in NATO and the Baltic Sea is small, yet um, uh, Nord Stream Pipeline was blown up in their territorial waters, notwithstanding uh, it, it, uh, them being in NATO and, and having a, a relatively small uh, territorial waters compared and, to and, and, and a substantially larger navy, of course, the Danish navy. And a substantially larger it's navy, it's per, it's particularly, it's particularly relative to the size of the territorial seas that, that it is required to patrol. So, you know, let's get real about protecting the cables. I mean, if somebody wants to take them out, unfortunately, they it's a bit like your car. If somebody wants to, you know, scratch, scratch the side of your car, you, you rely on people not wanting to do that because it's a sort of a, a, a rather pointless thing to do. And you rely on, on, on other countries realizing that they have a benefit from um from the subsea cables too and uh and uh that it's just an act of pointless sabotage okay all right michael it's been an absolute... uh, just answer one question sorry uh, you asked me about my political evolution and, and i didn't mean to uh avoid the question i mean i i, I did speak about the, the, the observing the political evolution of others but i mean i think covid was a profound political shock for me um it, it really was i mean i've i always had greater confidence in the state acting, um, respecting rights. Um, mm-hmm. And suddenly here was the state that it seemed to me to have little regard to people's individual rights. I, I think obviously collective rights are important, but a balance has to be struck and there was no attempt to strike a balance. Uh, it, it was a state that was in full authoritarian mode and the fact that that could happen so quickly and so easily in a state that uh, I, I was profoundly shocked by, and it has it, that did change how I view um, the state, the role of the state, and politics to an extent. I mean, not hugely. I still believe in the state. I still believe that the role of the state is to is to give people opportunities uh, and to provide, as, insofar as it can, for those who have. Uh, can't avail of the opportunities that they were provided, were not given opportunities, or have simply failed to do so. But um, so I, I do believe in a state, but uh, I think I'm much clearer about the um, the limits of the state and where those limits should be. Uh, closing churches or mosques or synagogues or places of prayer of any denomination was uniquely done in Ireland. Um, that was horrific. Um, on, I mean, uh, priests being persecuted for saying mass. Um, the 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 reaction to anybody who questioned any of it, uh, the almost um, uh, sort of the it was almost like a witch hunt for somebody who left Ireland. My God, they should leave Ireland for a, a country that exported half of its people for long periods of time. It was just a a, a very fright. I, I was a very frightening time for me uh, and one that uh, made me reconsider uh, the state and the, the 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 role of the state, the power of the state and the limits of the state in, in a way that I probably um, hadn't ever been been faced with before. Yeah, I think when the history of the series is written out, that 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 politically, I think that period will have impacted an awful lot of people. Anyway, Michael, uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking the time out of what I know is the, an incredibly busy week to talk to us. I, I hugely appreciate it. And as I, I say to every candidate running in this election, anyone who puts their name on a ballot paper is worthy of respect and thanks uh, for the public. If I you're the make one last point in the interview. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I I agree. I mean, you know, um, putting your um, name on a ballot paper is a difficult thing to do. But I think part of public service broadcasting is to give every candidate the opportunity to articulate their views. Now, you know, maybe every candidate can't be on during the prime time hours of sort of eight o'clock to ten o'clock on TV. But certainly every candidate in a 
should be given an opportunity by an outfit that uh, collects license fees because it pr- provides a, mm-hmm. a public service. I think every candidate should be given a platform. I think it's profoundly unfair uh, the way elections are, are covered uh, by our... And I say that as somebody who's benefited from being on the primetime show last night, but I'm uncomfortable uh, with the fact that every candidate isn't given a platform somewhere on RT. I mean, there's enough channels now. Uh, there's Iraqis TV showing um, uh, reruns of, of leaders' questions. Uh, you know, there should be some possibility to give candidates um, uh, a platform to articulate the views with each other uh, and with established candidates. Well, on that ecumenical note, we'll leave it. Um, I, I, I agree with you. Thank obviously, you I think a lot of reader will do. Listen, th- thanks, Michael. Best of luck next, um, next Friday. The elections, as everyone by note now, by now knows are on the 7th of June make sure you get out and vote and we'll be back soon with uh, one or two final interviews before polling day take care everybody